the story of East India Company, of a very strong libertarian, unregulated company, which through its own greed falls under government influence, is a story we must, must know in the fullest sense. But today, we have got ExxonMobile, Facebook, Google, and others which transcend sovereign boundaries and wriggle their way out of the laws of sovereign states. Let's traverse this journey with a man himself, ladies and gentlemen, William Dalrymple, along with Parvati Sharma. William is an acclaimed historian. We all know he's the best-selling author of Wolfson Prize-winning White Muggles, The Last Mughal, which won the Duff Cooper Prize, and the Hemingway and Kapsunki Prize winner for Return of a King. He has also won the Thomas Cook Travel Book Award, the Sunday Times Young British Writer Award, the Foreign Correspondent Year at the FPA Media Awards and been awarded five honorary doctorates. He writes regularly for the New York Reviews of Books, The New Yorker and The Guardian. In 2018, he was presented with the prestigious President's Medal by the British Academy for his outstanding literary achievement and for co-founding the Jaipur Literature Festival. Along with him, will we get into conversation with Ms. Parvati Sharma, she's a Delhi-based writer who has written across genres. Her debut is a collection of short stories called The Dead Camel and Other Stories of Love. She's also written a novel close to home. Um, a historical biography is also to her name, Jahangir, an intimate portrait of a great Mughal, and has written two more books for children. I now request Parvati to kindly come up, and the house is all yours, ma'am. Please take us forward with this journey. Uh, thank you and uh, welcome to this uh, session on uh, William Dalrymple's fantastic new book, uh, The Anarchy. <clears throat> um, William will be up in just a minute to uh, talk about the book. Uh, but uh, before that, I just wanted to say uh, well, first of all, I wanted to say that it's, uh, you know, Manu Pillai was supposed to be here uh, today, but unfortunately he couldn't make it and we miss him. Uh, but uh, so therefore I'm chairing in his place. I'm very happy to be here. I have uh, long admired William Dalrymple's uh, work. <clears throat> the first book of his that I read was uh, City of Gins. It was more than 20 years ago. I was still in college and I remember it now. Uh, first, of course, for its wonderful sense of humor, uh, for the enviable ease with which uh, William brings people, places, and history to life, and uh, most of all, for its sense of wonder and excitement. And for me, that sense of infectious wonder and, and, and excitement has been the hallmark of William Dalrymple's uh, work. Uh, there is excitement in no small measure in the anarchy. <coughs> uh, this is the story, as, uh, as the subtitle puts it, of the East India Company, corporate violence, and the pillage of empire. But it is told as a sort of edge of your seat narrative. And uh, this was an edge of your seat moment in history. Uh, it seems like looking back now that all of it was inevitable, but uh, a lot of it could have gone any which way, at any which time, across the course of the anarchic uh, 18th century that uh, William describes in this book. And one of those moments that looks uh, completely inevitable now is the Battle of Plassey of uh, uh, 1757. And this is one of my favorite uh, bits from uh, this book. Uh, the Battle Plassey in my dim school book memories uh, features, you know, Nawab Sirajud Dola fighting a sort of valiant battle, uh, marred perhaps by the uh, Black Hole of Calcutta, but otherwise fighting the good fight against uh, Robert Clive and the East India Company until he is undone uh, by <coughs> Mir Jafar, his own general. And uh, Mir Jafar has become a sort of synonym for treachery in uh, modern India today, uh, even in this uh, great Tamasha of the Maharashtra elections that took place over the last month, uh, Mir Jafar was a hashtag that kept popping up on, uh, on Twitter. 
uh, there is uh, there was an article some years ago about some some really hapless descendant of Mir Jafar who's fighting a losing battle to restore some dignity to the name. So it seems tourists arrive in Murshidabad to spit on Mir Jafar's grave and, uh, <coughs> and, and arrive at this man's door uh, and uh, drag him out just in order to revile and abuse him. But uh, William puts the delicate bits and pieces of the Battle of Plassey together and reveals how this uh, historical moment is comprised as much of uh, coincidence and chance and good luck and bad luck as by the deliberate action of its uh, protagonists. And in the process, uh, you know, Mir Jafar is, is, uh, is found to be not, um, but not a man of great ethics, but uh, certainly not a man capable of the kind of cloak and dagger intrigue that, uh, in fact, these days passes for political genius sometimes. He is, uh, he is a poor fellow, rather uh, 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 an, an incapable old man. And if there is a, fa a force that is colluding with the East India Company that is helping Robert Clive, that is a very different, very surprising force. And I will leave it to William to expand upon that. And before I, before I hand over to him, I <coughs> just want to say one thing. You know, there is, of course, that wonder and excitement in this book. It is tinged with another emotion. Uh, I think it's tinged with anger. And uh, it is not an easy book even to read without getting angry. It is, after all, the story of greed. And it is greed unleashed, uh, greed bolstered by power, almost limitless expanding power unmitigated by any kind of sense of responsibility whatsoever and cloaked in uh, anonymity. And uh, as you can imagine, that makes for a story that is uh, <coughs> often a horrifying story, uh, often a very tragic story. But, you know, in this day and age where the wealth and power of large multinational corporations is only increasing and increasingly anonymous, human action hidden behind uh, algorithms. It is also a very, very urgent story. So, uh, well, William, please. Uh. Could we have the first slide, please? One of the very first Indian words to enter the English language was the word loot. <laughs> Loot uh, was a word rarely heard outside the plains of North India until it took firm and permanent root in the English language in the 18th century. And if you want to understand how that happened, you could do a lot worse than start at this very English-looking castle on the Welsh borders. This is Powys Castle. It's now a National Trust monument. You pay your £2.50 and afterwards you go and have a cream tea and it all looks very English. There are cows um, munching grass in the fields below. There's a lovely Tudor box hedge garden as you make your way up. It's all very English. But then, next slide, you go up into the room in the tower. And what you see is something from a very different world. Because Powys Castle contains more Mughal loot than any one collection anywhere in India. Uh, even more than the National Museum uh, a short distance behind us. Uh, it contains Hindu statuary, gorgeous ivory chess pieces. As you can see in this slide, uh, shields and swords and talwars, uh, wonderful weaponry, elephant armor, um, golden tiger heads taken from the throne of Tipu Sultan, and one or two rather wonderful uh, oddities. Next slide. This in the foreground is the palanquin of Siraj ud -Dawla, abandoned on the battlefield of Plassey, uh, which later was taken by Clive home as a little um, memento uh, of the day's excitements. And if you go through the arch at the end of the uh, picture, you come into a gorgeous room filled with the campaign tent of Tipu Sultan. So what is all this loot doing sitting in the middle of the English countryside? Well, the story is partly told 
in a picture which you walk under to get to this. Next slide. This picture shows an effete looking mogul in cloth of gold handing a white document to a rather overweight, primped, periwigged and powdered English gentleman in a red frock coat. Uh, and this, says the in, uh, inscription below it, is the gifting of the Diwani. Now, the gifting of the Diwani is not a phrase that really means anything to anyone, either in India or in Britain anymore. But if you were to translate it into modern English, uh, it would really be, I think, an act of involuntary privatization. Because what is happening here is a scene uh, that took place after the Battle of Buxa, when the East India Company, a private company based in one small office in London, four windows wide, owned by its shareholders, uh, and which in 1765 had no government control uh, or regulation, uh, and was therefore um, had a free hand to do what it liked in its areas of interest, with very little parliamentary supervision. Uh, after this uh, battle, when not only Shah Alam in the center of the picture, but his two major Mughal allies, Mirkasim, the new Nawab of Bengal, and Shuja ud Dawla of Avad, were all defeated at Baksa. And the company suddenly found it had control over effectively the entire North Indian plains, the entire cow belt, modern UP, Bihar, uh, Orissa, and Bengal. And what the company demanded was the right to run the economy of the three richest provinces of the Mughal Empire. Today, we think of, I suppose, what Gujarat, Maharashtra, the Punjab as the richest part of India. Not so in the 18th century. In the 18th century, it was Bengal. And Bengal was the richest part of India because it had one million extraordinary talented weavers and had become, at the beginning of the 18th century, the world's industrial center. Today, it's quite fashionable to think of the Mughals as effete foreign invaders who wrecked and looted India. But the reality is it was under the late Mughals that Bengal became the central production industrial uh, center of the world. And for the first time in Indian history, India overtook China as a center of world manufacture. At this point in 1765, India controlled just under 30% of the world's GDP at a time when England comprised about 3%. And yet, at this moment, this extremely improbable moment, one company from that small country managed through military victory to overcome the richest empire in the world and seize control uh, of its economy and to control the rights of tax collecting and, uh, and minting. This meant that it, this was a crucial turning point seen from the, the kind of you know, distant perspective of, of long time. Up to this point, since Roman times, gold and silver had gushed out of the West into India. As early as the time of Pliny in the first century AD, you have complaints by Pliny that rich Roman women are draping themselves in Indian silks, rubbing their bodies with sandalwood paste and hanging diamond earrings from their, from their ears and, and placing them uh, on, uh, on rings. And the result, he said, is the wreck of the Roman economy with these uh, coins coming over the Red Sea and ending up in the coin hoards that archaeologists are still discovering in Kerala and on the Tamil Nadu coast. This carried on until this moment. Gold pouring out of Europe into India. But at this point, the dial changes. And gold begins to gush from India into Europe. And when you go to England and pay your £2.50 to go to Powys Castle or any other of those 18th century houses, many of those houses were built with the money sent back from India, from the East India Company's asset stripping and looting spree 
in the 18th century. It wasn't the only source of wealth. The other source of wealth was, of course, the Caribbean slave trade and the plantations of Jamaica, Barbados, uh, and the whole production of, of sugar uh, and cotton in the West Indies. But it was about half of Britain's, um, the source of Britain's great wealth at this period. Uh, and this moment is a crucial moment. In our history textbooks, we still talk about the British conquering India, but it's much more sinister than that. Next slide. This is where the East India Company was run out of at the time of the Battle of Buxar. It's not even the two buildings, the three-story buildings on the side. It's just the central one, two, three, four, five windows. This anonymous building, considerably smaller than even one wall of the habitat center, um, just two stories and a start skylight high, set back slightly from the street behind railings so that you could walk past it without even noticing that this building was there. And even a century into its existence, this building contained only 35 people in the head office. At no point, at the, even at the height of the company's power, were there more than two thousand white people, white Goras, British company officials in Bengal. The astonishing audacity of the East India Company was that it borrowed money from Indian financiers to pay Indian warriors recruited as sepoys twice the going rate of any Indian army to join the company army. And by 1799, the East India Company army was twice the size of the British army. 200,000 people at the time in 1799 when the British army had only 100,000 soldiers in it. But never more than 2,000 whites. India was conquered by Indian soldiers with money raised by Indian financiers. How did that happen? How on earth did that happen? Next slide. So we'll start at the beginning of the story. And it starts with this man known as Customer Smythe, or, uh, or Auditor Smythe. Auditor Smythe was the, um, who's the kind of uh, modern, I suppose, kind of the Vijay Malia of uh, Elizabethan, <laughs> Elizabethan London. Uh, slightly neater beard, slightly less of a paunch, and none of that sort of uh, welcome to Kingfisher Airlines sort of swagger to him. But uh, Customer Smythe was an entrepreneur like Malia, he inherited a fortune from his father, also called Thomas Smythe, and he made a new fortune by his mid-twenties importing currants from the Greek islands, which apparently were very popular in Tudor cooking. He then made a second fortune uh, starting something called the Levant Company, which was a small organization that he started with about 30 other rich London merchants and ship owners importing spices from Aleppo and Cairo. And then he made a third fortune in his 40s, taking over the London customs and taking a, a percentage of all his takings. So this was one of the richest men in London. And on the 22nd of September, 1599, he calls a meeting in Moorgate Fields. This is the point when September 1599 is when Shakespeare is just coming to the end of writing Hamlet, just to give you a little context. Um, it's first performed, I think, in November 1599. Uh, so if you were to walk from the Globe Theatre, those of you that have been to London know that uh, building by the side of the Thames. If you were to walk over London Bridge, where that attack happened yesterday, uh, and, uh, and walk for about 20 minutes to the north, you would come to Moorgate Fields, which in those days was not a slightly shabby tube station like it is today, uh, but was actually, as its name implies, an agricultural area on the edge of London. And there in the center of that was a building called the Founders Hall. Not founders as in uh, founding fathers or, or anything like that, but founders as in brass founders, people that made bells. It was a guild hall for the trade of the, of the brass makers. And Customer Smythe invites not just his 30 rich friends in the Levant Company, but he opens up this meeting to anyone in London who wants to make some money and has a little money to invest. And the reason he does this is that his Levant company, his big money maker, his, his Kingfisher Airlines, if you like, is in trouble. It sounds familiar, huh? 
uh, and uh, uh, it's in trouble because the Dutch have realized that it's far easier now with, with, eight, with uh, sorry, uh, 16th century sa sailing technology, rather than buying spices secondhand from Arab merchants in Aleppo or Cairo, you just sail around the Cape of Good Hope, around what's now South Africa, and you sail directly to what's now Indonesia, the Spice Islands, um, the Malaccas, and you buy cinnamon, pepper, and particularly nutmeg, which was very uh, important in European cooking at the time, uh, and you buy it directly from the producers and sell it at a quarter of the price uh, in, in Holland. And Customer Smythe found that his fortune was, uh, was being reduced very considerably by this Dutch innovation. So he decides to found an English East India Company, uh, or initially, actually, a London East India Company, to take on the Dutch, the Dutch companies that are doing this. And this meeting at the Founders Hall is the, is the time where he's trying to drum up subscriptions. Next slide. The East India Company was the ultimate bureaucracy, and I'm afraid much of your bureaucracy uh, derives from the, uh, from the obsessive triplicate filings uh, of this company. And we have every slip of paper that ever was produced by the company, including this, the very first subscription list from that meeting in 1599. And if you look at it, you can see uh, numbered all the big merchants of London. One's given 200 pounds at the top. Next one's 1,000, 200, 300. But what's important about this list, and it goes on for 15 pages, is that at the end are not the rich merchants. It's not the big ship owners. It is the ordinary mum and dad um, minor businessmen, grocers, haberdashers, skinners, vintners, used people, ordinary people with a little bit of money to spend. And Smythe has decided to risk a new business model, something which is very common and obvious today, but which is a dramatic and revolutionary innovation in Tudor England, and that is the joint stock company. These haberdashers and skinners and vintners are not expecting to have a share in the running of the company, but they do expect to get a share of the profits. And by opening this up to all investors, not just a bunch of other rich merchants of your sort of super rich class, Smythe was able to pull in an unprecedented amount of money as the seed capital. I suppose the equivalent today would be Elon Musk uh, opening up a subscription for his um, civilian flights to Mars. Uh, it's like that. But why? Because the East Indies in those days is an extremely risky venture. No one knows this more than the man who is commissioned by Smythe to lead the expedition. Next slide. Uh, and that is this man, Sir James Lancaster. Sir James Lancaster just come back from the Moluccas, but not with the ship on the, to the left of him up in the top corner, uh, because he'd just sunk his ship and half his crew had been eaten by cannibals. Uh, and so he was not necessarily the best, I mean, the most obvious choice to lead this new company into which everyone's money had been poured. But he was the only man that actually knew the way. So it was quite a simple uh, choice. No one else had been to the Moluccas before, so Lancaster gets the job. And with the money, they go down to Deptford Docks, and they look for a ship. And the first ship they see is a creaky old hulk called the Mayflower, which is clearly never going to go anywhere, so they leave that and, and reject it. It disappears from history. It's never heard of again. Uh, and uh, then they then settle on, well, what's actually a pirate ship called the Scourge of Malice. Uh, I'm not making this up. This is actually the name of the ship. And the Scourge of the Malice, uh, it sounds like it's sort of you know, Jack Sparrow's uh, flagship. Um, they quickly rename the Red Dragon as if it's a sort of comfy pub in the Welsh countryside. Uh, and uh, off they sail, but they don't get very far because at the, uh, at the edge of the White Cliffs of Dover, the uh, wind dies down, and for two weeks they're become just sitting in the channel, and people come and wave at them from the cliffs, and, and it's quite clear these guys are never going to make it to the Moluccas, uh, and that Lancaster has been the wrong appointment. But the wind picks up, and they in fact do, do sail off, and in due course they do make it to the Moluccas, but they don't even have to begin trading, because on their, just as they're approaching the Spice Islands, they see a Portuguese carrack coming in the opposite direction, and being a bunch of pirates, they board it and simply transfer the, uh, the spices in the Portuguese ship into their hold, and then they sail back to London. 
uh, where they sell the accumulated spices for one million pounds, making their fortune and propelling this business for the next 30 years. But they're always behind the Dutch. The Dutch are in there earlier, they've got better financial instruments, they're capable of raising much larger sums of money. So they, um, there's a, just like a sort of startup that's gone slightly wrong today and they have to reinvest and, re, uh, and rebuild their business model, they look at it again and they decide to, uh, there's a treaty, the, the Dutch actually defeat the East India Company. And to put a brave face on it, there's a treaty where the Spice Islands are handed over to the Dutch, and in return, the English East India Company is given a muddy river in some cold place in the Hudson River, and it's called Manhattan. Uh, anyway, that also disappears from history, and we never hear from that again. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the English now refocus on the textile trade, and kalamkaris, silks, and particularly cottons. And this is the decision that makes their fortune, because just at this moment, uh, the, this sort of fine aesthetic that has been cultivated here in Delhi, in the Red Fort, and in Agra, by the Mughal emperors, has diffused across India to Bengal, and that, those sort of Mughal textiles have become a huge fad, not just in London, but in Italy, in uh, Holland, and all over Europe, in Paris. And the company begins to ship larger and larger quantities of Indian textiles. And just to repeat, Bengal is what Manchester was, will become in the 19th century, the workshop of the world. There is a million weavers pouring this stuff out. And so great is the quantity of simple cotton goods, high quality, cheaply made cotton, made by Bengali weavers, that there is de-industrialization as far away as Mexico uh, because of the amount of Indian cotton shipped by the company to the new world. So the company builds its strength on the industrial strength uh, of the Mughals. The Mughals do not have a navy, or they have a very, a very um, small and, and weak navy, which is mainly used for transporting hajis to uh, the holy places in, in the Hejaz. And so it is the company that creams off the profits of, of Mughal exports. And the company is parasitic on the back of Mughal industry. And through the power of the moguls, the company becomes gradually from this small, stumbling, second-rate joint stock company, it becomes more and more of a trading giant. Next slide. The company builds a new headquarters in Leadenhall Street. Next slide. They build their own docks uh, at Deptford, uh, which begin to manufacture about 20 ships a year. Next slide. And all goes... Uh, goes well until political chaos breaks out in India on the death of Aurangzeb. The, the uh, Marathas are pouring out of their hill forts, like Raigad, uh, raiding the Mughal ports like Surat. Uh, in the Doab, south of here, the Jats are rising up and taking uh, and, and, and stopping traffic passing between Delhi and Agra. In the Punjab, the Sikhs are, are massing. And it becomes more and more clear that Delhi is weak and vulnerable. Next slide. We seem to have got a helpful um, laser jet advert up on the slides. Could whoever's in charge of the slides remove the laser jet advert? And can we see a picture of Delhi? Thank you. Here's the red foot. Uh, so Delhi at this point, next slide, with Chandni Chow, because it's incredibly elegant central boulevard, is the largest city in the world. A million people live in Delhi. There is the next, uh, on either side, the next biggest cities are Edo, modern Tokyo in Japan, and Istanbul, uh, mod, uh, mo Istanbul uh, in, in Turkey, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and Delhi is looking more and more vulnerable with all these rebellions breaking out across the empire. But it's not the Jats, or the Sikhs, or the Marathas who get to loot Delhi. Next slide. It's this guy, Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah is the son of a humble furrier. His dad makes fur hats. But he joins the Persian Safavid army, and by sheer co military competence, he rises to the top, affects what we would call a military coup, and takes over Persia. And then, in order to fight his real enemies, who are the Russians and the Turks, he decides to, as he puts it, 
pluck some, mo pluck some golden feathers from the mogul peacock's tail. So he enters Afghanistan. There's no opposition. He takes Kabul and Kandahar. He comes down the Khyber Pass. Again, no opposition. He takes Peshawar and Lahore. And finally, the Mughals get their shit together and send an army of 1.5 million people up to Karnal. The Mughal Empire, which has already begun to diffuse, pulls together. And the, the Nawab of Avad appears from, uh, from Faizabad uh, with one army. Nizam al Mulk appears from Hyderabad with a second army. And uh, poor old Muhammad Shah Rangila comes with his dancing girls uh, and his musicians, a few soldiers, and quite a lot of sort of, you know, the Khan market crowd and Dior glasses uh, and ladies taking selfies and all this sort of stuff. And, uh, and it's a bit of a mess because the whole of Delhi is coming to watch. It's a huge deal. Everyone's going up to fight. No one's fought for a while. Um, and uh, everyone's up there. Uh, Delhi's empty. There's not a single person in Khan Market. Uh, and um, facing them are 160,000, a fraction of that number, Persian troops. But they are armed with the latest military gizmo, which is something called the swivel gun, which can pierce any Mughal armor. And so Nadia Shah lures the Mughals out of their encampment, and they line up over about five-mile-long line across the plains of Karnal. And they go into a trot, then a canter, and finally into full gallop. And at the last minute, the Persian cavalry, light cavalry, part like a curtain, and facing this army are this line of swivel guns. Five minutes later, it's all over. The cream of Mughal chivalry lies dead in the ground. And that night, next slide, next slide, Nadir Shah on the right invites poor old Muhammad Shah Rangila to dinner. And of course, the idiot goes, with the, with, again, with the dancing girls and the musicians uh, and a small bodyguard. And inevitably, after dinner's over, the bodyguards are disarmed, and Muhammad Shah Rangila is told he's the guest of Nadir Shah. The next day, they march into Delhi. Six weeks later, Nadir Shah marches out again with the peacock throne, with the koh i -Noor, with five other Mughal thrones, and with 8,000 wagons filled with gold, silver, and jewelry. Everything the Mughals have looted from the rest of India and the sultans before them over 600 years, since the time of Alauddin Khilji, just gets carted off to, uh, to Herat by Nadir Shah in one fell swoop. Now, the British like to feel they were pretty good looters, but they were rank amateurs compared to Nadir Shah, who takes the whole lot in one go. And without that cash, it, I, I don't know, how would you, it's like, imagine you throw a large Baroque mirror out of a top floor window, out of here. It hits the ground and it smashes into a million pieces. Because there's no money to pay the army, because there's no money to pay the civil service, the whole of Mughal India fragments. And where before there's been one unitary state which, into which all taxes pour uh, and which can put four million men into the field at the height, instead you get this patchwork of small, culturally vibrant states, Jodhpur, Jaipur, Tanjore, the little Carnatic states, Hundreds and hundreds of states. This is one of the great cultural moments of Indian history. This is when Carnatic dance begins in Tanjore, when Nine Sook is painting in, 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 uh, 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 up in the, the Guler and Jasrota. Um, culturally, this is an extraordinary moment because everyone's been liberated from the Mughal taxpayer. They don't have to send any money in. So what do they do? They, they spend it on dance and painting and architecture. A lot of the stuff you see in Rajasthan when you go on holiday there, it's all built at this moment. But... Militarily, it leaves India fragmented, divided, and weakened. And the first people to take advantage of this next slide are the French. Now, I know this looks a bit like a sort of uh, gay pride parade circa 1770, but this is actually the cutting edge new military technology. Um, the French import new military innovations from Europe that have been developed in the course of the um, war of the Austrian and Spanish succession the new military uh, techniques of, of Frederick the Great of Prussia, which are the bayonet on the end of a musket, elevating screws on cannons, the square, 
new forms of muskets which fire enormous great lead balls that are like dum-dum bullets and that they, they enter about one centimetre wide and punch a hole six inches wide when they exit. And they're horrible weapons. And the French try out these troops. They realise if the Scots can do this, that you can train up Tamilins, uh, people from Andhra, Telugu warriors, and they try it out. They try these new military techniques on newly recruited Telugu warriors, and they put them in the field against the Nawab of the Carnatic. And 700 Telugu-trained French sepoys defeat 30,000 Carnatic cavalry in 1740 at the Battle of the Adyar River. And for the next 40 years, there's this window when Europeans can more or less march wherever they like across India. It doesn't take long for Indians to catch up. By, 17, well, by the 17, late 1770s, early 1780s, both Tipu and the Marathas have, have got exactly the same sort of weaponry, it's exactly the same sort of training. The French have taught them how to do it. They've got excellent cannon, and they're defeating the East India Company. But for 40 years, these sepoy armies can defeat huge Indian armies sent against them. Next slide. And the first to feel the heat, next slide, is this guy, Siraj Udala. Now, Siraj Udala, who in your textbooks is this great nationalist hero, is in fact a really nasty little punk. Uh, his, his, uh, his cousin, Ghulam Hussein Khan, who's this wonderfully witty, urbane uh, chronicler, describes him as a serial bisexual rapist uh, whose idea of pleasure is to sink a uh, uh, sink boats in the Ganges and watch the people uh, drown. He's a really nasty piece of work. And French, English, Dutch, Mughal, and Bengali sources all tell this story of this. Of this. So this guy gets pissed off with the company for building new fortifications in Calcutta. And he goes and he attacks Calcutta and he takes it. There are virtually no troops in Calcutta at this point. The, the, they haven't got sepoys. They haven't done this military innovation there. So in the, uh, in, he does it, though, at exactly the wrong time. Because next slide, this man has just turned up at exactly the day that the news of the fall of Calcutta reaches Madras. A, a Navy Marine force led by this man, Robert Clive, arrives in Madras. Now, Clive is also a nasty piece of work. Clive thinks, I don't, I don't know, how would you describe it? Think gangs of Wasipur in, I know, 1740s Market Drayton. Or his uncle leaves these descriptions of Robert Clive as this horrible little kid who throws stones through the windows of shopkeepers who won't pay him and his friends off. He even at one stage lies in a gutter and diverts the gutter into somebody's shop and floods it um, when they won't pay, pay him protection money. His uncle wants to put him in the church. That's clearly not going to work. Uh, he then decides he might make a good lawyer. Indeed, he might. But instead, he ends up in the East India Company. He comes out here. He hates India. He doesn't say a single word about the beauty of the landscape, the culture, the religions. He's, he's miserable. Twice he tries to commit suicide and fails because he's a bored accountant sitting over his ledgers, missing home. But then when the French take Madras, he escapes and he makes it to Fort St. David, where he's trained up in these new military techniques. And he is the first man to train up sepoys for the English East India Company to take on the French East India Company. And he turns out to be a violent, psycho, military genius. Clive attacks from behind. In this age when warfare is like, um, like a sort of an elaborate chess game, Clive breaks all the rules. He attacks from the rear, he attacks in the early morning through fog, he attacks in the middle of thunderstorms. He's ruthless, he's very good at sizing up his opponents. And he comes up with his marines and he retakes Calcutta. Now this marine force, incidentally, has been sent out not to take on Siraj Adali, but to take on the French. Rather like with the, invasion, the American invasion of Iraq, there's a dodgy piece of intelligence which is delivered to the East India Company saying that there is a large French fleet on its way to Bengal. And the Admiralty sends out a Navy fleet to take on that French fleet. In fact, the French fleet has sailed to Canada, completely opposite direction. So this large 
British Navy force arrives in Madras with nothing to do, and it arrives at exactly the moment that Clive has taken Calcutta. So it's diverted up to Calcutta, it retakes Calcutta, it then bombs the shit, shit out of the uh, French East India Company settlement at Chandanagar uh, and reduces Chandanagar to ruins. And Clive then writes home to his dad saying he's heading back to Madras and he's had these two great victories. And then something crucial happens. An emissary comes from the Jagat Set, who is the Marwari main banker in Bengal. Money flows into the Jagat Set's coffers, writes one East India Company official, like water flows from the Ganges into the sea. He's invented a new type of money transfer, whereby rather than sending the tribute of Bengal by road, in wagons, guarded by soldiers, all the way from Murshidabad to Delhi, he can just do it, you pay it into the Jagat Set's office in Murshidabad, and you withdraw it from the Jagat Set's office in Darya Ganj. But the Jagat Sets take 10%. Good worries. And, uh, and they do this so successfully that by the 1730s, they're already doing regime change in Bengal. And when they don't like Murshid Kuli Khan's successor, they put in Ali Verdi Khan as, a, as their candidate. Now, when, when Siraj Daula threatens to circumcise the Jagat Set if he doesn't give him a loan, the Jagat Set simply writes to Clive, and says, I want you to remove Siraj Daula. I will pay you two million pounds personally and two million pounds to the company. And Clive says, righto, no problem at all, sir. I'm coming. And the next slide. So the Battle of Plassey, which is portrayed in English textbooks as this great gallant colonial victory that sets off the road to empire, is in fact entirely a setup because the main general on Siraj Daula's side, next slide, is, next slide, is Mir Jaffa. And Mir Jaffa, again, is, is very kind of, you know, both Clive and Mir Jaffa are in the pay of the Jagat Sets. He's a slightly dim, elderly Arab from Najaf in modern Iraq. He's old, he's not very clever, he's illiterate. And he's, all he has to do in the Battle of Plassey is not fight. And he doesn't fight. And then he walks off at the, at the end. Siraj Daula flees the battlefield. Five days later, he's caught, murdered, and his mutilated body is paraded through the streets of Murshidabad. A day after that, Clive walks into the Murshidabad treasury and just fills his pockets. He then fills 40 barges full uh, of, of jewels and, and money, which he punts down to Fort William in Calcutta, where it's unloaded, and the entire revenue of Bengal just moves from Rashidabad to Calcutta. Later, when he's questioned by Parliament about this, because he's got no authorization to do this, he was sent to attack the French in Bengal, not to start doing regime change for his own personal profit. When he's questioned in Parliament about this, his defense is merely, my lords, I'm astonished at my own moderation. Uh, the bankers were on their knees before me. The richest men in the world waited for my smiles. I could have taken it all. I merely took 40 barges full. But this is what puts the boot on the company's foot. From now on, they know that they can defeat any army. And they do it again eight years later at the Battle of Buxar. Shujo Daula, Mir Qasim, and uh, Shah Alam, next slide, are all defeated. And in the aftermath of this, the Diwani is signed. And now you do not have to send any more money out to India. For centuries, Europeans have been sending money to India, particularly the company, galleons full of gold and silver to buy these textiles. Now they've got a much better business model. They don't have to bring any gold out, they just tax the Bengalis. And with the money that they make from the taxing the Bengalis minus the cost of the occupation, they use that money to buy the textiles, and they then sell it at a profit. So it's money for nothing. So for the next 10 or 15 years, the company is coining it, rather like in New York in the 1980s with the hedge fund managers and all the big bankers, with all the Porsches and you know, setting off champagne in restaurants, all that. it's like that. Any fool that joins the company comes back with 100,000, 150,000, 200,000, huge sums of money. Suddenly, these nabobs, as they're called, 
which is just a, an English corruption of Nawab, and which is further corrupted into the word knob. Um, uh, these knobs and nabobs come back, they buy up company, they, sorry, they buy up parliamentary seats in, in, in parliament with rotten boroughs, they bribe their way into election, it would never happen here. Uh, and uh, uh, they then, um, <laughs> certainly not in Maharashtra, uh, and, <laughs> and um, they then buy up large country houses, and everyone's getting irritated with these new rich guys turning up with huge sums of money in their 30s. Meanwhile, in India, they are asset stripping it. And like all rich, greedy capitalists who are not being regulated and not being looked after, because the, the, the British government's not looking at this. As far as they're concerned, this is great. They're getting a third of their tax revenues coming from, uh, uh, from uh, customs uh, cuts on the company's imports. So the British government is rich. It's like GST all over again. Uh, and, uh, and everyone's thinking, great, this is money for nothing, we're suddenly very rich. But then the company, just out of sheer greed, kills the goose that lays the golden egg. And in 1770, the great Bengal famine happens. One fifth of Bengal dies of starvation. Some estimates put it even higher. Certainly one million die. Murshidabad is a, is a carnal, carnage house. There are bodies piled up in the streets, dead and dying, then make their way to Calcutta. The Ganges is clogged with corpses. The sky is black with cl clouds of vultures and, and, uh, and, 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 and flies over the dead bodies. Um, dogs are eating human remains. It's, uh, it's an apocalypse. It's horrible. And it's so bad that for the first time, whistleblowers start writing back to London about it. You get a p accounts of this famine in the Spectator, in the Gentleman's Magazine, in Blackwood's Magazine. People are actually writing home saying for the first time where this money is coming from. And everyone had kind of known that something dodgy was going on because they couldn't have that much amount of money coming in legally. But no one had looked too closely until this point. Now, a million are dead. And suddenly, the company for the first year sends its sepoys out into the villages and it maintains the full tax collection at pre-famine rates the first year through violence. So in addition to all the other bodies, there's now gibbets with people swinging from it who haven't been able to pay their taxes. Second year, the same happens. They pull, they send the sepoys out, they manage again to get, despite the fact that a million people are starving, they manage to get full pre-famine pre tax revenues. Not a single tax, the soup kitchen is set up, not a single, um, uh, uh, biryani is provided to the, the starving. It's, it's just, because it's a company, it doesn't regard itself as a job of governance or anything, it's just there to make money, like Goldman Sachs is. It has, I mean, the one thing that's nice about the company is it doesn't have any of that Victorian cant about civilizational mission or anything like that. It's just about profit. You join the company to make a fortune. There's nothing, that's what it's there for. That's what it does. So when it's a famine, they say it's not our problem, not us. But the third year, they've literally, as one of the whistleblowers put it, picked the bone of Bengal clean. There's nothing left. So the land revenues sink massively in 1772, and the company's share price sinks with it, and suddenly one, two, three, then 30 banks collapse across Europe. The governor, of the, the governor of the East India Company, Colebrook, goes bust, and the company has to go first to the Bank of England to borrow four million pounds, and then later in the summer has to, has to go back for another 10 million and the bank doesn't have it. So parliament is recalled, it's been prorogued, it's recalled, and it's discussed in parliament what's to happen, and they decide, of course, that the company is too big to fail. So they have to bail it out. So the world's first corrupt multinational is bailed out by the world's first mega bailout. It's the subprime times 10. All that stuff 10 years ago, time ago. And from that point, the company moves from being a sort of libertarian wet dream to being a public-private partnership with the government now beginning to sit on the head of the, of the East India Company. Regulators are sent out to India. And from that point, there's an irreversible creep with the government, which had previously taken no interest in the company for 200 years, beginning to do more and more until, of course, by 1857, it's nationalized. Next slide. 
By this stage, the company has moved from 4,000 sepoys to 20,000 to 100,000. By 1799, there are 200,000. Next slide. All these different regiments all lined up in a row with their gleaming weaponry. Next slide. Tax collectors have, like Colonel Todd have fanned out across India to collect, to collect money. Next slide. A new business model has begun. On top of all the other ways they've got of making money, the textile trade and so on, they begin to grow opium in Bengal. They then sell that in China in the biggest narco operation in history. It makes the Medellin cartel look like rank amateurs. Um, there's a Netflix series in this somewhere. Uh, and um, they, they sell opium to China. And with the profits of that, they buy tea, which they sell here in India, in Europe, and in America. So when the Boston Tea Party takes place 10 years later in 1780, this is East India Company tea, which is poured out. So by this stage, the East India Company has become the world's first great multinational. It has straddled the globe from China to America and everywhere in between. And one of the reasons for the American Revolution, which never makes it into American textbooks because no one knows this stuff, but which Emma Rothschild has written about brilliantly, is the fact that the, there's, following all these reports of the looting of Bengal and the, the Bengal famine, the American colonists are worried that the East India Company is going to be let loose on them, which is why it's tea that's the symbol of protest, because it's the symbol of the company. So here now, this company, this, which, you know, this muddling small company founded at the time of Shakespeare, has become the largest capitalist organization in history with an army larger than any nation, a modern army larger than any nation state in the world. It's an unprecedented threat. Next slide. Its flag is even pinched by some new colonial uh, uh, creature um, with minus the Union Jack in the corner. Next slide. By this stage, the company's headquarters are spread up through Leaden Hall Street. Next slide. Uh, this is the racecourse road of its day. This is the uh, director's boardroom where the decisions about India are made 16,000 miles away from India. Next slide. By this stage, the company has built half of London's docks. Next slide. Uh, in the Brunswick docks, 700 East India Company clippers a year are being churned out year after year to move opium and textiles around the world. Next slide. And it all builds up until 1857, when its own sepoys are the ones to bring about the revolt. And in 1857, you have starting, uh, it, centered in this city, in Delhi, the largest anti-colonial revolt to take place against any European power at any point in history. 200,000, out of 200,000 East India Company sepoys, 160,000 mutiny. And they come here, and it's in the plains of Delhi and on the ridge at the behind, uh, behind the, uh, the civil lines that the, the future of India has decided. The company wins, next slide. But in the unprecedented carnage which follows, with about 300,000 innocent civilians killed between Delhi, Kanpur, and Lucknow, finally, Parliament blows the whistle. Next slide. And the company is rounded up. This is the punch cartoon. Hearing these reports about how sepoys are blown from the mouths of cannon, punch has East India Company House being blown from the mouth of the cannon when the company is rolled up with less fuss, says the Times, than a regional railway bankruptcy. And this is the, the fragments of the East India Company House being blown up. Nepotism, blundering, avarice, and misgovernment. So no one mourns this company when it's rolled up and nationalized. But the important point to grasp is it is a company, and up to this point, Everyone talks about the Raj. Indian cinema, when it depicts the British and India, always deals with the Raj. Kipling, Curzon, those are the familiar references. But the Raj only lasts 90 years. It's this brief flicker in the eye of Indian history between 1858 and 1947. But the company is there from 1599 to 1857, 250 years. It's the bit of the iceberg beneath the water we all forget about. It's the much larger period of history. And it doesn't even pretend to be about railways, civilizing missions, universities. It's about profit. 
just as Goldman Sachs, just as any big bank or any hedge fund is about profit. That is what it's about. And it's India and the asset stripping of India which provides the money which goes into the pockets of the shareholders. And to fill the pockets of the shareholders is the point of the company. So this book has two themes. One is this forgotten story, how it was a corporate looting, not a government looting. The government steps in by 1858, and you get 90 years of government rule. But it, company period, it's a corporate story. And in that, you have the seeds of everything that we fear about modern international corporations. Because the company is the first company to get involved in a global way. It's also the first company that begins to realize that rich companies can corrupt governments. In 1697, there is the first public inquiry into the corruption of parliament when it's found that the East India Company is offering share options to parliamentarians who vote to extend its monopoly. Later, the company sets up the world's first corporate lobbying group. The same thing that goes on today goes on in parliament in the 18th century. Today, here, it's the Adanis, it's the Tatars, uh, it's, all these, uh, it's all the Mawaris. They are the ones who are giving money to, uh, to parliamentary parties, unstated pro quiquos. We never quite know what is offered in return. The same happens in Britain. The same happens in the United States. But this world where corporations fund political parties and where political parties then offer unspoken pro quiquos, and suddenly you find this strange thing where the interests of a company's shareholders suddenly become the interests of the state. So we find in 20th century history endless examples where corporations bring about regime change. Think of 1953 in Iran. Mossadegh, the first democratically leaded, uh, elected leader of Iran, the kind of Nehru of Iran, is toppled by the CIA because he plans to nationalize the Anglo-Persian oil companies, CIA and MI6 together, a joint coup. Two years later in Guatemala, United Fruit plans to nationalize the agricultural land of Guatemala, which is 42% owned by this one company, United Fruit. When news comes that this democratic socialist government is going to do land regulation, the CIA brings about a coup, and the phrase Banana Republic is born. 1977, in Chile, Allende's government is, is going to nationalize ITT, which does all its, uh, uh, all its pr production in Chile with cheap labor there and you get the coup, and you get the, the nastiest hunter, Pinochet, the nastiest hunter uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, South American history being replaced. So this is not sort of the imaginings of some sort of, you know, right on lefty. This happens. Corporations alter the way governments make policy. Lobbyists exist to do that. When decisions are made about who gets agricultural land to build plants on, government doles out great chunks of the coast of Gujarat to uh, such and such an oil company. That's done through corporate lobbying and through corporate donations. This happens every day. The East India Company was the, was the origin of this method. The company invents the idea of corrupting parliaments. So this is not just a story about the specific conquest of this country. It's the story of how corporations take over all our lives. Today, no company actually claims sovereign control of a territory in the way that the East India Company did. No company, not even Google or Facebook or ExxonMobil, actually have infantry regiments or cavalry. But they are listening to this conversation now. All of you with mobile phones, you're all going to get East India Company tea adverts in your social media feeds tomorrow. In a sense, they don't need to have infantry regiments. They control our thoughts. They suggest things to us. Every time we open up Facebook, every time we scroll down our Instagram feed. This is the world that the East India Company started. I'll just conclude, next slide, with a quote from, next slide please. Uh, from the uh, impeachment of Warren Hastings. Tech guys, next slide, very good. Warren Hastings. Warren Hastings' impeachment is the one time the British Parliament actually grapples with the East India Company. 
Hopelessly, they get the wrong guy. Warren Hastings, in fact, has done famine relief measures. He learned Bengali and Persian and, and Urdu. He's the least awful of all the, of all the governor generals. But in his impeachment, you get, for the first time, the power of corporations questioned. This issue which still exists today with these huge corporations which control our lives is discussed in Parliament for the first time in 1780 at the impeachment of Warren Hastings. And the Lord Chancellor stands on the podium at the opening of the impeachment. And I'll just conclude with this quote. And he said, Corporations have neither bodies to be punished nor souls to be condemned. They therefore do as they like. Thank you. The relentless rise of the East India Company, there's a second tragic note that runs through it, which is the relentless fall of, uh, of Shah Alam, the, uh, the last sort of Mughal emperor to ever have had a hope of exercising any kind of, uh, any kind of power. But I don't want to get into that. I want to ask you one question, uh, William. You, in the book itself, and also in what you've said around it, I've heard you speak very strongly about uh, you know, the need to tell this unknown story, and you've told unknown stories before, you know, the Bahadur Shah Zafar, the, La the white Mughals, but it seems like this is prompted by something more than just historical curiosity. It seems like you've said that, you know, and especially that you want the story to be known in Britain. You've even compared uh, the lack, the ignorance of colonialism in Britain with the uh, sort of uh, conscious education about the Holocaust in, in, in Germany, and you've said, uh, so do you, want to, do you want to say something about sure. that, your impulse? The, the, this, this whole period is a period that both in India and in Britain is shrouded in mythologies. From the British side, the mythology is that the British Empire was this benign force. In a recent opinion poll, I think 59% of Britons said they were proud of the British Empire. And the reason that happens is that there is no education about this in Britain. You guys find this hard to imagine, but kids in Britain jump from studying the Tudors to studying the Nazis with a brief stop off on how the British ended the slave trade. So you get this impression in British history classes that the, the, the Britain is this incredible anti-racist force that's been operating throughout history as this incredibly benign place, taking on the Nazis, ending the slave trade. But here too, history is shrouded in mythology, and particularly this period. So the whole question of collaboration is the thing that I've been emphasizing in my, just as I emphasize the looting, the asset stripping, and the plunder of this company when I'm talking in Britain, because that's what the Brits don't know. When I come here, I tend to emphasize more the collaboration, because that's the bit which has never faced up to here. Because as I say, there was never more than 2,000 white guys in Bengal. They borrowed money from the Mawaris, they borrowed money from the big Hindu banking houses in Banaris and Allahabad and Patna, and that was the money which went to recruit the Indian armies which staffed the East India Company. The East India Company army never had more than 1% British officer class. 99% was brown Indian warriors fighting for double the salaries offered by anyone else. Triple the salary offered by Tipu Sultan. Triple the salary offered by the Marathas. So they get the pick of the best troops. And it's very easy to condemn these people and regard them as traitors. But in a sense, you have to try and understand how this happened. That's the point of history, try and understand how, in order that it doesn't happen again. How did it happen? Well, there's a number of reasons. First of all, Calcutta is like Dubai or Singapore. It's a tax-free zone. The
nightmares about the bargis that Bengali mothers teach their children uh, uh, in, in the present day. And so they regard the company as the least worst option. Then the Bengalis begin to invest their money in company bonds. And to raise money for the armies, the company offers exceptional returns on five-year, six-year bonds, whereby you, you get your money effectively doubled. So Bengalis invest their money in the company. Then in the 1790s, you get something called the permanent settlement, which sounds very boring in history books, but what it means is, is incredibly important. What it means is that the big Mughal Jagirs, which stretch out over vast areas of Bengal, are broken up and auctioned off in small pieces. Who buys it? The Debs, the Maliks, the Tagores, the, the, the North Calcutta, Badralok. And they buy it, and they then become part of this British system, this company system. They become subsumed into it. They are the gainers of this system. So why do they do it? They do it the same reason we all do the things we do to look after our children, to save our money, to increase our capital, to, to get through life, to make a profit, to be able to function. They do it because they regard it as the least worst and most profitable option. And once sorry. you understand that, in a sense, you begin to understand how this happened. William, sorry. I think, though, I think Jeremy Corbyn may have heard you because I heard he's included uh, it in his manifesto that colonialism will be taught if he comes to power. But I'm very sorry. I think we've run out of time completely. We have to end.